This is what we in Australia call a giant millipede. In Africa, the animal that gets called a giant millipede would be over twice this size, but even they completely pale in comparison to what came before them. For this video, we are returning to the Paleozoic era, this time to focus on the Carboniferous period. In previous videos, the animals we looked at hailed from the Cambrian and Ordovician periods, when life was predominantly, if not exclusively, restricted to the waters. But by the Carboniferous, which began a little under 360 million years ago, life had well and truly laid claim to dry land as well. The arthropods were the pioneers of the animal kingdom's conquest of this new frontier, and their hard exoskeletons and jointed limbs, which provide them with structural support underwater, were easily capable of doing the same job on land. Among the first arthropods to have walked the earth were a group whose modern representatives are one of the more familiar faces on this channel, the myriapods. Out of the four major myriapod clades alive today, the most speciose are the diplopods, commonly known as millipedes. The millipedes have a long history in the fossil record. One of the oldest animals known to have possessed clear adaptations for life on land, Pneumodesmus pneumoni, was a millipede. Some other early millipedes had extraordinarily elaborate armour, and even toward the dawn of their immensely long history, they were already beginning to approach the size of the largest millipedes alive today. But it was during the Carboniferous that these multi-legged marvels would reach their peak, at least as far as size was concerned. For it was this period that saw the evolution of the uncontested titan of the millipedes, Arthropleura armata. Measuring over two and a half metres long, Arthropleura was the largest animal on land for much of its existence and holds the additional title of being the biggest terrestrial arthropod known to have ever walked the Earth. It lived throughout most of the Carboniferous period, and even persisted into the early Permian, the final period of the Paleozoic. And much to the surprise of absolutely no one, it's also one of my favourite prehistoric animals. Arthropleura's tenure in the public eye commenced in Germany, in the early 1850s, with the discovery of several fossilised tergites, which are the armour plates that cover the upper surface of an arthropod's body segments. However, the jumbled, disarticulated state of the fossil made it difficult to paint a clear picture of what the animal would have looked like, and thus there was no immediate consensus on what Arthropleura actually was. I mean, it was clear that it was an arthropod of some sort, but anyone who knows how diverse of a group arthropods are should be well aware of just how little that narrows things down. Some proposed that Arthropleura was a crustacean, or perhaps a relative of the trilobites. However, the finding of additional specimens, including ones that preserved the ventral anatomy, namely the legs, gave rise to hypotheses that suggested a myriapod affinity. But its positioning within the myriapods was subject to debate, with some interpreting it to be a centipede, others a poropod, and still others suggesting that it belonged to a grouping separate from any of the four living myriapod classes. Fossils of small arthropleurids found in France provide reason to suspect Arthropleura was, at least to an extent, diplopodus, meaning that some, or perhaps most, of the body segments possessed two pairs of legs instead of one. Today, of course, diplopody is regarded as one of the key characteristics of millipedes. Just take a look at any centipede versus millipede comparison video, including my own. Apologies for the self-promotion. And you'll very likely see diplopody being cited as one of the principal identifying features for millipedes. And while Arthropleura's relatedness to other myriapod groups has historically been subject to debate, nowadays it is generally accepted that it was not merely a millipede relative, but an actual millipede. Arthropleura was a dorsoventrally flattened animal, similarly to certain modern millipedes like polydesmids and platydesmids. 
Its body was divided longitudinally into three distinct lobes, and the tergites were peppered with numerous small buds called tubercules. While there is little ambiguity concerning the overall appearance of Arthropleura, our knowledge of certain more specific features is comparatively vague. Case in point, the animal's head, of which currently there are no known fossilised remains. There have been many attempts to reconstruct the head of Arthropleura. One of the most common, and also one that is almost certainly inaccurate, is very clearly based off the anatomy of a centipede, complete with forcipules and long, filamentous antennae. Now, look, I'd love it if Arthropleura did indeed resemble a centipede. Centipedes are awesome, and the more animals that look like them, the better. If dogs looked like centipedes, I may have considered getting one. But with the increasingly robust body of evidence pointing towards a millipede affinity, that is hardly plausible here. Oftentimes, reconstructions of Arthropleura's head are not even based off the correct part of the animal's body. Instead, they're based off the column, which is the first segment behind the head and separate from the head itself. But while the head of Arthropleura remains an enigma, fossils of a closely related animal can provide a little insight. Microdecamplex, a myriapod that hails from the Devonian, the period preceding the Carboniferous, isn't quite as impressive of an animal as Arthropleura. At a mere 5mm long, Microdecamplex would be minuscule even by the modest standards of today's millipedes. Yet its anatomy suggests that it was of close relatedness to Arthropleura, and unlike its gigantic cousin, fossils of Microdecamplex have been found in which the head was preserved. Similarly to present day millipedes, the head of Microdecamplex was tucked beneath the column, and would have been heavily obscured when viewing the animal from above. But Microdecamplex also suggests that reconstructing Arthropleura's head may not be quite as simple as slapping the head of a typical modern millipede onto the body and calling it a day. For the head of Microdecamplex exhibited a markedly different form from any of its living relatives. Protruding from either side were a pair of vaguely trumpet-like structures which have been suggested to represent what are known as tomospharae organs, a feature present in certain modern millipedes as well as a few other arthropods, though their function, even in living species, is not clearly understood. Situated close to these horn-like protrusions were smaller appendages, possibly the animal's antennae, which compared to those of modern millipedes were proportionally rather diminutive. Of course, we can't say with absolute conviction that Arthropleura's head anatomy precisely mirrored that of Microdecamplex, but since the latter does appear to be more closely related to the former than any living millipede grouping, it does make a little more sense to base Arthropleura's head off that of Microdecamplex as opposed to any of its present day counterparts, let alone centipedes. We can go all over the place discussing the wither twos and why falls of Arthropleura's anatomy, but let's get back to what I'm sure we can all agree is the animal's standout feature, its gargantuan size. But what could have been responsible for allowing this millipede to achieve such impressive dimensions? And now I'm sure as soon as I ask that question there's a bunch of people in the comments section right now typing what they think is the simple, obvious answer. If you look at any video addressing the question of why so-and-so prehistoric animal got big, be it dinosaurs or pterosaurs or megalodon, the comment section is usually just one colossal clamouring chorus of oh, wieners, wieners. There was more oxygen in the past, so everything got bigger. It's a pretty efficient answer. Quick memorable, simple to understand, and makes sense at the surface level. And just like most common knowledge about prehistory on the internet, it's also to no small extent bullshit. The gigantism of many prehistoric animals, namely dinosaurs, is completely explainable without assuming higher atmospheric oxygen content. 
And while estimates of prehistoric oxygen concentrations are subject to a level of uncertainty, with no two studies arriving at identical conclusions, what is clear is that oxygen levels have fluctuated throughout geological history. Certainly there were times at which they were higher than today's, but there were also times when oxygen was at comparable or lower levels relative to present day. Simply saying there was more oxygen in the past is a massive overgeneralization. But what about Arthropleura? Surely the oxygen explanation is still relevant here. The Carboniferous period is, after all, the period in which oxygen levels are generally agreed to have hit an all-time high. Well, while Arthropleura's gigantism is very often attributed to the elevated oxygen levels of the Carboniferous, it doesn't seem to be quite that simple, especially in the light of a recent fossil discovery. In England's Stainmore Formation, the partial remains of an Arthropleura were found that, when scaled to the body proportions known from examining more complete fossils, represented the largest individual of the species uncovered thus far. But every bit as noteworthy as its record-breaking size was its age. The Stainmore Formation dates to the Serpikovian, roughly in the middle of the Carboniferous, and likely before the spike in oxygen concentration. Indeed, there is even evidence to indicate that oxygen levels during the Serpikovian were scarcely higher than today's. And yet, Arthropleura was still clearly able to reach its famed gargantuan proportions. So with oxygen seeming less and less likely to be a principal reason for Arthropleura's massive size, what other factors could have been at play? It's been proposed that Arthropleura may have attained giant sizes due to having a thin, lightweight exoskeleton. This, however, is an explanation worth taking with a grain of sodium chloride, as many fossils of Arthropleura appear to have been malted exuviae as opposed to the actual carcasses of the animal, and thus may not be an accurate representation of the thickness of the millipede's armour. If anything, more recent research has been increasingly suggestive of the contrary, that Arthropleura had a thick, well-sclerotized exoskeleton. It's also been suggested that diet may have contributed to the millipede's unprecedented size, and the lush world of the Carboniferous and early Permian would have doubtless provided plentiful feeding opportunities. Pollen, seeds, fructifications and megaspora hills are all potentially energy-rich meals that may have helped provide ample nourishment for such a large arthropod. But while we can infer things, Arthropleura's diet isn't exactly set in stone, pun not intended. Fossils that were previously interpreted as direct evidence of herbivory in the form of preserved gut contents are now regarded as nothing more than coincidental fossilization of plant remains alongside those of the millipede. It is also, in my opinion, well within the realm of possibility that Arthropleura may have consumed animal matter too. Indeed, even some modern millipedes will, on occasion, do exactly that. But with no clear fossil remains of Arthropleura mouthparts or gut contents to provide robust, unambiguous evidence, informed speculation based off its environment and the behaviour of its living relatives is about as far as we can go when it comes to Arthropleura's diet. Bottom line is, we can't say for sure what was responsible for Arthropleura's gigantism. But one thing that is becoming increasingly apparent is that there was a lot more nuance and complexity behind it than simply oxygen equals big leggy fucker. Now we arrive at the final topic of this video, the eventual extinction of this awe-inspiring arthropod. And for uncovering this, the last chapter in the giant millipede story. Some of the most relevant clues stem from our knowledge of Arthropleura's habitat and distribution. Arthropleura is commonly depicted as an inhabitant of dense, swampy rainforests, essentially the stereotypical Carboniferous landscape, but in actuality it appears to have primarily occupied more open settings. 
An abundance of track fossils preserved in sandstone deposits with scattered plant remains suggests a preference for loosely vegetated sandy areas in open river landscapes. This rainforest independent lifestyle is further supported by the fact that Arthropleura seem to have been more or less unaffected by the widespread rainforest collapse at the end of the Carboniferous. So the decline of the great coal forests that typify the Carboniferous appears hardly likely to have played a role in Arthropleura's demise. But what about competition? Well, towards the later part of its tenure, Arthropleura coexisted with large, terrestrially adapted amphibians like Areopids, as well as Pelagosaurs, which were early relatives of mammals. But Arthropleura had been living alongside such competitors for millions of years without showing any obvious signs of decline. So that doesn't quite come across as a major driver of its disappearance either. It seems much more likely that the catalyst of its extinction was something far greater than merely the advent of some new competitors. The locations of Arthropleura fossils indicate that the animal had a predominantly equatorial distribution, and the millipede's disappearance from the fossil record coincides with a steady aridification of the equator during the Permian period, with increasingly intensified bouts of seasonal dryness. Eventually, it would appear that this change became too much for Arthropleura to handle, and the largest arthropod known to have ever walked the Earth was lost to time, its story locked in stone, while its smaller relatives continue to survive and thrive, an indispensable part of our ecosystems just as they always were, and ever a source of intrigue and wonder for those willing to take a closer look at the great wilderness beneath our feet. And that brings this video to a close. Now, needless to say, the myriapods of the present day can't really hold a candle to Arthropleura as far as size goes. Nevertheless, there are still some that are incredibly impressive. And if you'd like to learn more about them, then feel free to check out this video on the five biggest centipedes on Earth. And if you'd like a more in-depth coverage on the differences between centipedes and millipedes, then this video should be exactly what you're looking for. Of course, if you enjoyed my content, then feel free to subscribe as well. Thank you all very much for watching, and I shall see you again very soon.